anyone? Okay, so welcome uh, again, uh, once again, to, uh, to everyone who's joining us for the fifth installment of our Patriarchs class today. I want to, uh, to look at the 14th chapter of uh, Beratius and study with you uh, really uh, underappreciated and understudied section of Parshas Lech Lecha. You know, the problem with the Parshios and Beratius is they're so chock full by the time you get through the first Elias, so you're ready, you know, it's next week and you, you're moved on to the next, uh, to the next section, the next, uh, the next Parsha. What I want to look at with you today is an incident that involves one of the minor characters, a man called Malki Tzedek, who we know very little about, but seems to play an outsized role. And I want to make the case in a few minutes that he plays uh, an even bigger role than, uh, than we might imagine. But it's going to take a little work on our part to uh, uh, to get there. So let me put things in context. Um, it's actually a long uh, it's a long chapter. The 14th chapter is a long uh, the long chapter. We're going to jump in in the middle. Okay. So we have a uh, a regional conflict. There's a war going on between the five kings and the four kings. The five kings represent five cities, five, uh, five towns, we might say, if we lived in Long Island, and the four kings represent four other, uh, four other regions, four other towns. Um, and uh, it, it's quite protracted, and it, in, in, it envelops the entire, uh, the entire region, and it's going on for 12 years, for 14 years, right? This isn't a small, uh, this isn't a small matter. And I want to pick up with you, Perik Yudalid Pasuk, uh, Pasuk Yud Gimel. Okay, so I'll just pop it up on the screen so we're all kind of literally on the same uh, on the same page. Um, and the Torah tells us uh, the following. Okay. Okay, so Avraham was living in uh, in Elone Mamre. Uh, among these uh, among these friends and uh, allies of Abraham, uh, who are his friends, who are his allies, Eshkol, um, Aner, and uh, and Mamre. Okay, and uh, lo and behold, uh, a palit, a refugee who's unnamed, a refugee escaped from the battle, and uh, and he comes and uh, and he gives Abraham a message. Vayishma Avram ki nishpa achiv. Okay, and we talked about this uh, extensively last time. The Torah consistently and uh, and often refers to Lot as Avraham's ach. Okay, so he's not literally a brother. He's the son of Avraham's deceased brother Haran. But the Torah always wants us to recognize the brotherly relationship between the two, not just relatives, brothers. So Avram hears that his brother has been taken captive okay, in the passive voice. We don't know who did it. We don't know who's responsible. We just know that he's been taken captive. We'll come back to this uh, expression a little later. But Avraham mobilizes. Okay, he mobilizes the, uh, the, the, the forces in his, uh, in his home. Chanichav, right? So you know that word, chinuch, means uh, uh, to train, to initiate. So these are Avraham's trainees, his students, his acolytes, whoever they are. Shmona asar ushlosh meos vayirdov adan. He mobilizes his troop. It's amazing. He's got his own in-house militia, 318 men, and, uh, and he pursues the captors as far as, uh, as Dan, you know, the Rashi. So 318 just happens to be the gematria of Eliezer. So maybe it wasn't a whole militia. Maybe it was just Eliezer. Either way, Avraham gets involved in this battle. And he, uh, he has some strategy that's obviously quite successful. And uh, he he wipes the floor with his enemies, and uh, he pursues them until, uh, until Damascus. Okay, and he brings back everything. It wasn't just Lot that had been taken captive. Lot has a whole entourage with him. So it's all of his, uh, all of his stuff and all of the people. And Avraham saves not just Lot, but everyone uh, in Lot's in encampment. 
Okay, so that's the background of the story. And now, uh, and now what happens? But Yetzei Melech Sedom Likroso, Achrei Shuvo Mehakos Eskedar Laomer, Vesa Melachim Asherito, El Emek Shavei Hu Emek HaMelech. So what happens? The battle is over. Avraham has accomplished what he set out to accomplish, and he's rescued, uh, he's rescued Lot. And in the process, he's defeated the enemies of the five kings. So now, one of those five kings, maybe the leader, maybe the most powerful, maybe the most prominent, the king of Sidon, comes out to, uh, to, greet, uh, to greet Avraham. Uh, in the wake of the successful military campaign that Abraham has waged. So he comes out to greet him, and we fully expect the next Pasuk, right? Pasuk Yud Zayin tells us that the king of, uh, of Sidon uh, comes out to greet Abraham, and now there should be some conversation, right? So the king comes out, and what did he say? Shekoach, thank you so much. It was a pleasure doing business with you. You're such an extraordinary ally. I was in this war for 14 years, and without you, I never could have uh, never could have done it. But something bizarre happens. What happens after Pasuk Yud Zayin? Comes Pasuk Yud Ches. Okay, so you forgive me, because I didn't give you the first half of the parak, but go back to the first half of the parak. I can assure you, we never heard of Malki Tzedek. He comes out of, no, he's not one of the five kings, he's not one of the four kings, he's not one of the allies, he's not one of the captives, he's not one of the captors, never heard of him. Malki Tzedek, Melech Shalem, we never heard of him, and we never heard of Shalem. That's not one of the regions that's named in the conflict. So, one sec, I thought we were going to get a message from the king of Sodom, who was prominent, prominently featured in the conflict, so now there's going to be some important conversation between the king of Sodom and Abraham. No, we interrupt this. Uh, we interrupt this program for an important message from a man we never heard of, from a place we never heard of, so that we can have bread and wine. And by the way, I just want to let you know who Malki Tzedek is. He's a Kohen. What's a Kohen? What, what does that mean? A Kohen to whom? Was he a pagan priest? Right? So you're putting on the world stage in the middle of the Torah, Parshas Lech Lecha, we're learning all about Avram and ethical monotheism, and we just want to pause for an important message from a Kohen, La'el Elyon, I don't know what that means, God on high, right? El, Aleph Lamed in the Torah is, is generic. Sometimes it means Hashem, sometimes it means a God, lowercase g. So it's a kind of conflict here because it's a lowercase g, but El Elyon, the highest God. So is that Hashem? What, who's Malki Tzedek? What's a Kohen El Elyon? What's the bread and wine? It, he's coming out of nowhere. Who, what's this about? Continues. We're still waiting, right? The Melech Sedom, it's like, uh, you could just see this in a, in a Hollywood production. So he's like frozen. He's waiting for his line. And, and he just got upstaged. He doesn't get to speak. So he's in, in animated suspension. No, suspended animation. And, uh, and who's got center stage? Malki Tzedek. Okay. He blessed him and he said, this is now a speech by Malki Tzedek. Never heard of him. Baruch Avraham el Elyon konei shamayim ba'aretz. Blessed be Avraham of Hashem on high, God on high, maker of heaven and earth. And not just blessed be Avraham, but blessed be, but blessed be the El Elyon. Okay, let's just say it's Hashem. Asher Magain, Asher Migain Tzarecha Biadecha. Okay, he delivered your enemies into your hands, but he tain lo maser mikol. Very ambiguous here. He gave Maser a gift, tenth. He gave a tenth of everything that uh, that he had. So who gave what to whom? There's three parties here. There's the king of Sodom, suspended animation. Malki Tzedek, never heard of him. Avraham, major military victory. And someone is, uh, the bread and wine we know that, that Malki Tzedek gave to Avraham. And now someone's giving a major gift. 10%, if it's really ma'aser, right, from the word eser, a tenth, 
if it's really 10%, so that's like, you know, Elon Musk selling 10% of, uh, of Tesla. So it's a, it's a fortune, right? To the, uh, to the victor go the spoils. This conflict ate up the whole region. If you're the winner of this conflict, so you're a, a bajillionaire. 10% give it, if that's Avram who's giving it away, it's a huge amount. If it's, if it's Melech Shalei, Malk I have no idea what that is. Maybe it's 10% of his, uh, you know, trip to the bakery because he brought the bread, no idea. And now the suspended animation ends. Vayomer Melech Sedom El Avram. Ah, finally, the speech we were waiting the whole time, right? Now, finally, we get to hear what the King of Sedom says to Avram. He says, I want to, I want to propose a, a bargain. Here's the deal. My suggestion is give me the nefesh, right? We always translate nefesh is soul, but soul in biblical Hebrew really means person, right? Or in the plural people. So give me the nefesh, give me the people, give me the, right? How many people do you get when you win this war? There's a lot of captives. Give me the people of our Abraham will split it. I'll take the people, you take the money, right? Because there's all the spoils, all the booty. And Abraham answers, he says, no, it's not going to happen. I've lifted my hand to Hashem, maker of heaven and earth. I'm not taking a penny, right? Not a shoelace, nothing. Below Samar and he has Sharti as Abraham. No one should say, God forbid, right? Anyone should say that you, king of Sodom, made Abraham rich. I'm plenty rich. I'm good. But no one should say that it's attributable to you. Okay, so the people who were in the battle and were my allies, so they need to receive their due compensation right? Fair, uh, fair wages for all those involved. But me, I take nothing. End of chapter. Okay. So we have a lot of uh, unanswered questions and a lot to, uh, and a lot to explain. Who's Malki Tzedek? What does it mean that he's a Kohen? Who gives the Maser to whom? Why does Malki Tzedek appear out of nowhere? Why is the King of Sodom uh, in suspended animation? How do we understand the interruption of the narrative? What is the meaning of this in the larger story of the life of Avraham and Parshas, uh, Parshas Lech? So I want to start um, with, uh, if you'll indulge me, with a, a conversation. So I want to put up this um, uh, this Rubens on the screen. You know this Rubens? I love Rubens. You know how big they are? They're like, you know, so it's a Rembrandt times ten, right? So it takes up the whole room when you see uh, when you see a Rubens, and it's like lifelike and it's life size, and these battle scenes and the horses and the people, right? So this is a Rubens from circa sixteen twenty six. I actually I forgot to note down where this Rubens is. I'm sure you can Google it. And it's called Meeting of Abraham and Melchizedek. Okay. So, and again, if you want to just Google it and pull it up on your own screen, so it's bigger and fresher. So tell me what you, tell me what you see, what you notice, any messages that you can derive from this painting. And obviously every painting, right, is an interpretation. And you know, it's some tension, right? Maybe he's trying to be true to the to the text, um, and maybe he's adding something, interpreting something. And you know, I'm not an art historian, but I'll just say, you know, somebody paints the Akeda, somebody paints Matan Torah, somebody paints, you know, Yitzias. So we get that he's painting the meeting between Avram and Malki Tzedek. It's like how many of his you know, patrons would have even like known this. This is such a, what kind of scene is this? It's like a, it, it seems like such a footnote and yet it's this huge painting, right? With uh, look at all these, 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 uh, you know, colors and the, the depth and the images, right? Not, I didn't even notice it at first, but there's the horse. You gotta get the horse in. So tell me what, uh, tell me what you notice. Tell me what, uh, tell me what you see. Just feel, I mean, everyone's muted, but you should be able to just unmute yourself and, and jump right in. 
Any takers? No wrong answers. Or if you want to ask another question, why was Rubens painting this? Not a Jew. Even though Rubens sounds like such a Jewish name. Okay, so I'll give it away. Okay, why was Rubens painting this? Anyone? Think Christianity? Eucharist? Okay, so the, the Christians love this because what does Malki Tzedek bring? Bread and wine! Okay, so they see this as a prefigurement of the Eucharist. Right, so it's all about the the wine and the uh, and the wafers. So they love this, right? Because what a what a scene. Okay, so that may be so, and obviously, right, it's very prominent. So you could see the loaves of bread, right, that are being uh, that are being exchanged. Presumably, what's going on here at the bottom in the center are these huge vats of wine, right? My image of the scene is like, you know, a token. So some bread and a bottle of wine, but the, he's bringing like wine and uh, wine and bread for all, right? It's not just uh, it's not just a little gift, but right, everyone is going to be uh, everyone is going to be supported uh, by this. Anything else you want to take away from this uh, painting? Right, look at the lobes here, right? They're being carried on the guy's back, right? It's a whole. It's a whole basket full of uh, uh, full of loaves, and you have all these jugs of uh, you have all these jugs of wine, right? Presumably, who's who's who? Right. So this is Malki Tzedek on the uh, on the right, and he's dressed regally, royally, because right, he's a king, and fascinating, he's a king and a priest. And Avraham, right, he's still got his sword and he's coming from battle and he looks, um, you know, I don't want to say disheveled, but but he's the one who's been working. And the elder statesman, so, right, he's, uh, he's calm and everything is, uh, and everything is well uh, with him. Okay, there's more to say about this, Rubens. Again, I'm not an art historian. I invite you to think about it and look at it and study it and enjoy it because it's really an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary painting. Um, but I want to um, I want to share with you a couple of a uh, couple of comments, and then I want to make really one central argument uh, this evening. Okay. So the, the first thing I want to just um, share with you: anyone remember this? We don't get in the section we just looked at, but anyone remember the name of the king of Sodom? It's mentioned in the first half of the chapter. Anyone remember his name? His name is Bera. Bet Resh Ayin, okay, which again, if you kind of repunctuate it or, or look at it differently, it, it, it would sound like Bera, right, in evil, right, which is so fitting because he's the king of, uh, he's the king of Sodom, and for everything we know about Sodom, it, it's associated even in, forget the Midrashim, right, even in the Psukim, it's associated with Ra, right, it's the, the cry of Sodom comes up to Shem, the people are Ra'im. So I just want to uh, uh, share with you a comment of the, uh, the Orafayim. He says something quite, uh, uh, quite compelling. Um, and you have this in source one on your source sheet. He says, the tam shehifsik bi'inyan. Okay, everyone notices this. It's an interruption, right? Malki Tzedek shows up right in the middle of this story. The tam shehifsik bi'inyan melech shalem ben yitzias mit melech sedom lo das devarav el Comes right mid-conversation. So the Orachayim just wants you to notice that the Torah is going out of its way to demonstrate the distinction, the disparity between the Tzadikim in the story on the one hand and the Rishayim in, in the story on the other. So the Orachim says it's a setup. The Torah just wants us to notice. The Torah just wants us to notice the, the posture, the orientation of the king of Sidom when we get to him. Because we could miss it. But it's stunning. 
at the end of this conflict, if you are the beneficiary of Avraham's success in this battle, so you should be offering him something. And the Orachim says, just notice when the king of Sodom shows up, he's empty handed. How could he be empty handed? This man just saved you and your whole region. And, and you don't have a, a thank you gift. You don't have a card and a bottle of wine. So to throw it into relief, Malki Tzedek, who's not even in the war, he comes with the tribute, right? He comes with his patronage, so the bread and the wine and the gifts, right? And look at all the colors that get right in the, in the Rubens just to, to bring it home. He says, right, so Malki Tzedek is the opposite. He owes, he owes Avram nothing. He wasn't in the war. And yet, just noticing this is a war hero, what do you do for a war hero? You come with a tribute and a, a token and the melech and the yayin and the lechem. So it, the Orchim says, it's just to show you the difference between what a normal, decent, righteous person does on the one hand versus the king of uh, the king of Sodom, he comes with nothing. The Orachim doesn't say it, but if you just go back to the Pasuk, and it's so conspicuous, right? The Orachim helps us appreciate the degree to which this, this is conspicuous. What's the first thing out of the king of Sodom's mouth? His first words in Pasuk Chafalif, Tenli, tenli anafeshvar. Even if that was the proposal, you don't start with that. You start with, thank you. I'm so grateful. What an honor. You're such an important and, uh, and skilled military person. And we're so indebted to you. Uh, you know, here's my proposal. Tenli, who starts the conversation with the words tenli? It's unbelievable. So the Archaim says, in case we would have missed this, which I guess we could have, you read this carefully, you know, uh, quickly without reading it too carefully. So there's a conversation and the Torah is, you know, not embellishing and we're just trying to get, you know, from here to there. The Torah says, I just want you to appreciate how crazy, wild, outlandish it is that the king of Sodom would start his conversation this way. And Malki Tzedek helps illuminate the degree to which the, the king of Sodom is, you know, on a different planet when it comes to the norms of civility and decency and dignity and humanity, right? He's operating by a different playbook and it's not, and it's not the right book. Okay. So that's, I want to say as a kind of, uh, a kind of introduction. And I want to get to what I consider the, the, the heart of the matter. Um, and what it is that I want to um, that I want to uh, share with you in um, in the time that we have in the time that we have uh, left. Okay. Um, by the way, I'm sorry I didn't uh, I didn't share it with you. But if you look at source number two, so that's just again without resort. We know the midrashim about uh, you know Sodom and the dislike of the unlike, and if you came and you were too short and they lent without even the midrashim, right? All those midrashim are also based on the text, right? They're not pulled out of thin air. But even the text itself, so we just go to the Pasuk in Yechaskel, so it tells you what the sin of Sodom was, right? And the sin of Sodom was that they, that they never gave bread to the Ani and the Evion, right? They failed to support um, with uh, materially, they failed to support materially those, uh, those in need Right, so it, it all goes back to the king of Sodom, right? He's not interested. He starts with, with 10. Okay. So does anyone remember Rashi quotes, Rashi cites in Midrashic tradition about the identity of Malki Tzedek. Anyone remember who Malki Tzedek is according to Rashi, according to the Medrash? Anyone remember? So there's a, there's a, a kind of unwritten rule in the uh, in the medrash, I think I once saw it referred to by someone on the outskirts of the academy as like the rule of conservation of identities, the rule of conservation of identities, biblical identities. So what does that mean? It means that um, the rabbis are always uncomfortable with anonymous figures. Okay. So 
they identify the otherwise anonymous figure as someone that we know from another from another context. So it can't just be that you know Yosef is uh, wow. is wandering about in a field and this unnamed man points him in the right direction. It must be someone we know. It must be uh, Gavriel, an angel. You know, so this man, uh, our parsha this week. So this, uh, you know, man, angel, whoever you know, fights with uh, fights with Yaakov. It must have been Sarah Shalei. It can't be an anon. We must know who it is, right? So, and it must be someone from a different context. So, Rashi, you can see in source number uh, source number three, he writes the following: Malki Tzedek Midrash Agada, who Shame Ben Noah. You know who Malki Tzedek was? Malki Tzedek is a is a, is a name for a character that we otherwise know as Shame Ben Noah. Shame happens to be his name is name, but putting that aside, that's for a different conversation. Shame is Shame Cham Yafes, one of the three sons, maybe the oldest son of, of Noah. Okay, so he's from another time. He's from another universe, right? He's from the pre-flood world. He's the you know, one of the only survivors, one of the only people who actually knows what it means, right? Shame would have overlapped with Adam Harisha, right? He's from a, another time. So the, the Medrash says that Malki is um, is shame. So it's interesting, but my question, if I could put it irreverently, is uh, who cares? Well, how does that how does that help us? How does that move the story forward, right? What, what's the significance? What's the relevance of, so Malki Tzedek is not some random person. He's actually a very, must be very old, uh, very old, maybe very wise uh, person who's the son of Noah. Okay, what, why? why? Why would we you know, benefit from, uh, from knowing? So I wanna share with you a medrash that I had never seen before, which I think is um, is stunning and very uh, very illuminating. I'll pull it up on the screen. It's in source number uh, source number four. I hope you can you can make it. Okay, bear with me. This is going to be a little out of left field. You'll you'll make the connection in a minute um, to see why it's relevant. So the the medrash is talking about uh, a jealousy and the trait of, uh, of Kina and what it means to kind of be aware of other people and to somehow have a desire to be like them or to be with them or to be near them. Kina, right, sometimes positive, uh, uh, channeled positively, sometimes channeled negatively. So So don't be jealous of sinners. Right, Hashem says, you want to use your jealousy, con jealousy constructively, you should be jealous of me. Just don't give kina a bad rap. Uh, kina is actually an indispensable ingredient in the world. And if not for kina, the world would not exist. And no person would, uh, would get married. No one would build, uh, would build a house. Okay, so again, there's a, you could do a psychological analysis of this uh, this medrash, right? But the, the premise is, right, that people do these things in life because they see other people doing them and they want to be the person who fits in or be that uh, be that person. Interesting formulation, right? If not for jealousy, if, if not for Avram's uh, Akina, so he would not have acquired heaven and earth. What does that mean? The Amosai Kana. So when was he ever jealous? So Sha'amr Lamalki Tzedek, Sha'amr Lamalki Tzedek, Ketzad Yatsasa Minhateva. So the, the story is the, the following The Medrash says that Avram asked Malki Tzedek, Right, Ketzad Yatsasa Minateva. How did you make it out of the ark? Amrle Bitstaka Shahayinu Osim Sham. He says, You know what saved us on the ark? Malkitzedek, shame, 
is now talking to Avram. They're having this conversation in the Midrashic imagination. Avram wants to know the secret to, uh, to Shame's success on the ark. And Shame says, I'll tell you what the secret to our success was. Stucca. Stucca that we did on the ark. Avram says, I don't get it. Is what stuck could you possibly have done? You're self-sufficient. There are no poor people on the ark. What's the, the stuck on the ark? It's just a family. Who would have been the recipients? Shams says, no, no, we did stuck in the sense that we supported the animals and the birds and the wild animals. We, we, we didn't sleep a wink, right? We were taking care of the animals the whole time. You know, we, we, we were zookeepers. We had to feed them every night. We're up all night. This one needed X, that one needed Y. Whatever they needed, we did. Oso Shah Amar Avraham, Uma Ilulesha. Uh, so Avram starts to do the, the math. He says, wow, the secret to their success was that they did staka for animals. Right? And in that merit, in the merit of just taking staka for, for animals, right? That was that was enough for them to be saved. So he says, wow, if that was the secret to success for Noah's kids, Noah and, the, and his children on the ark, so he says, imagine what I could do with people. And he has this uh, epiphany, and in that moment, he plants his Eshel in Beersheba, right? And that's the base camp for his Hafnasas Orchim and everything that follows in the legacy, in the legacy of Abraham, whether, whether it means Achila, Shesia, Lina, Eshel is, a, is an acronym for all the things that he provided for uh, the people. Right? Why do I share this Medrash? Why do I share this Medrash? I share this Medrash because the, the Medrash is functionally telling us, right, what I think is, is stunning. There's an unanswered question, right, which we we never we never smoke out, which is how did Avraham become Avraham? Like where where did it come from? And the you know the Rambam deals with this on a philosophical level, and how could the world have come into being? And if there's an artwork, then it must be an artist. Putting aside the philosophy, right? What about just the morality and the the humanity and the pragmatics of it? How did Avraham become the paragon of, of chesed that, that he was? How did he become not just the paragon, but the paradigm? Right. Where did that come from? And this medrash is suggesting an answer, which I think is very deep. And you'll tell me if you, you know, agree or disagree. But the medrash is telling us that Avraham was really not the initiator of chesed in the world. He had a teacher. His teacher was shame. His teacher was Machitek. Now, Avraham took it to a new level, and Avraham used the values that he learned from shame and applied them in ways that right, had never been applied before. And Avraham becomes the, the father of the, the Jewish people and the father of and the father of Chesed. But I think it's paradigm altering to think of Avraham as, and again, this is the argument I want to want to make, and I'll build it out in a second. But, you know, we, Abraham Avinu, Abraham is the progenitor, and we always think Abraham is the teacher, and Abraham is the father, and Abraham is the patriarch. Abraham is also, right, we talked about in our first class, Abraham is also the son, following and living the unlived dream of his, of his father. And now Abraham, the Medrash is telling us, and again, we're going to see it in the Pesukim, Abraham is also the student, right? Abraham learns from Malkitzedek. Avraham learns from shame. So but I'll just as a parenthesis, if you just look at the next source, because it it just it, it fills out the Midrashic tradition, the next source um, just says, um, you know, by the way, there's a parenthesis. Um, after the Akedah, 
right? The, the, the Torah tells us that Abraham and Yitzchak went up the mountain together. And then at the end of the Akedah, Vayeshev Abraham el Nara. So at the beginning of the Akedah, there were four people. Abraham said to his two uh, servants, used to here at the bottom of the mountain, Bani Banar, Nelcha Ako, and Yishtachav Abin Ashubalif. And I'm going to go up the mountain with, uh, with Yitzchak, we'll come back. Except what happens, Abraham and Yitzchak go up the mountain. And then the end of the story is in the singular, Vayeshev Avraham El Narav. Avraham returns to the, one second, two people went up the hill. He's, he didn't get shafted. It was, a, you know, the story got interrupted. He's still alive. We, we know the continuation of the story. So what happened to Yitzchak? Where, where'd he go? Why didn't he come back with Avraham? So Yitzchak, Heichan Haya. So the Medrash says, where was Yitzchak? What, what's the Torah telling us that Avraham returned? Singular, only him. You know where he went? Shame. Went to learn with him for three years. He had a private uh, study session with, uh, with Shame, right? And, and we all know the Midrashic tradition that uh, Yaakov learned in the Yeshiva of Shame Be'ever for 14 years, right? So if you put it all together, I've never actually seen anyone, you know, put it all together, but that's why this is interesting, right? So Shame is the teacher of Abraham and Yitzchak. And Yaakov. Wow. Okay. So this might invite us or encourage us to know something more about shame if he's the, the teacher of Avraham Yitzchak and Yaakov. Okay. So let me share with you the, the Nitziv, I think, is on to this, uh, is on to this train of thought. Um, and uh, and he, he starts to put it together for us. Okay, in source number uh, source number six. So the, the Nitziv says the following. Um, source number six, the Nitziv says, Hivsi kakasuv um, davar uh, malki tzedek ben yitzi es melch sedom ludvarav im, uh, im Abraham Avinu. So we all, we all got it. We got the question, right? The story is interrupted mid-sentence with the, the narrative of malki tzedek's conversation with Abraham. The chuvas Abraham belashon el yon karnei shamayim v'aretz lamad mimalki tzedek. He says, go back to the Psukim and just notice what Avraham learned from Malki Tzedek. Okay. So, right, this, it's amazing what the Nitziv is arguing, and I think it's explicit in the Psukim. You have to, to, to appreciate this. You have to imagine the conversation that Avraham would have had had he not been interrupted by Malki Tzedek mid sentence. Every every line about Malki Tzedek is Malki Tzedek Mel Shalem Hotzi Lech Miyam Hu Ochrin El El Yom Pasuk eighteen Pasuk nineteen Vavrech Av Yamar Baruch Avram La El El Yom Kanesha Mai Marts Pasuk twenty Uvarch El El Yom Judith uh, Klisner has an essay about this. She has a nice formulation. So I didn't put it on the sheets. He's, I'll paraphrase. She says Avraham was looking down, you know, at the people and the spoils and the. What, and Malki Tzedek interrupts the story and says, Abraham, look up to the El El Yom. This is not your doing, right? This is all a function of the divine will. And the fact that you're so successful, you know who that uh, the, the attribution goes to? The attribution goes to El El Yom. So moral lesson, right? Moral lesson of Malki Tzedek, just reminding you, Pause story. And it's amazing. You can just see this like in, in film. Pause, sidebar. There's just like this little voice, the narrator. Just remember, Avram, it's not about the people. It's not about the money. It's not about, it's all from Hashem. It's all from Hashem. Okay. And the, and the break, go back to the, the action. And now we're ready because the, right, the little voice on his shoulder has spoken. And Melech Sidon makes this wild offer. Let's split the, you know, you take the, uh, the, the spoils, I'll take the people. Listen to Avram's words. This is what the Nitziv says. The Nitziv says, Avram channels Malki Tzedek. He never spoke like this before. But go back and listen to his words. He got that straight from Malki Tzedek. That's straight out of the plus of three lines earlier. Right, he just borrowed all the language that he learned from Malki Tzedek and uses it in his response 
to the king, to the king of Stim. And and it uh, and it goes on, right? So the Nitziv uh, continues. Um, he has an even earlier source um, from the from the Shiltos, who says right explicitly that Abraham got this language directly, directly from uh, Malki uh, Malki In the interest of time, I'll just summarize the um, the the seventh source uh, for you. There's a debate. Right, as I uh, mentioned, it's totally ambiguous. Who gives what to whom? There's a uh, there's vayiten lo maser mikol in pasuk uh, pasuk twenty. So the radak in source number seven says, you know who gave maser? Malkitzedek gave maser as a demonstration, as a teaching moment, which is in this moment, Malkitzedek says you need to be in a posture, in a position, in an orientation of giving. Right, stone, melch stone. He knows this, right? Malki said, he's going to say tenly. He's going to be able. What can I take? And Abraham, just remember, your job is not to be a taker. Your job is to be a giver. And here I am with lechem and yayin and maaser. I give. That's what I do. And he signals, right? He signals to uh, to Abraham. That's what you should do. And that's what Abraham does. He says, I'm taking nothing. I give everything away. Whoever needs, right? Not me. I'm not going to be the taker. I'm going to be, I'm going to be the giver. Okay. So I'll just say, um, I'll just say a uh, a word about the uh, about the Kohen. Okay. And then I'll start to uh, and then I'll start to wrap up. We can now answer the question of what it means to be a Kohen. A Kohen is. Right. What's the Kohen? What's, what's the Kohen's role in Jewish life? Right. The Kohen is someone who teaches and models the ethics and values of God. So Malkit said it's a Kohen. So, you know, later there'll be a hereditary quality to priesthood, but in its essence, that's not what it's about. Remember what the original plan, who were supposed to be the who are supposed to be the ones to serve in the in the temple, right? Before the Egel, who was it going to be? It was going to be the poor. The Bechor, right? The firstborn in every family. So it was just going to be representative. So it wasn't intended to be hereditary. Like it's, you're not born a priest, you're just born a person, and you're, you have a mission, you have a calling to be a teacher, to be a role model for others, to model the, the values and ethics of a godly nation. Right? It's about ministering to others by providing them with the wisdom of what it means to serve God on high. Malkitzedek, right, is the Kohen par excellence. And now we understand this, um, you know, this midrashic tradition that Rashi uh, that Rashi cites, um, making Malkitzedek out to be. You don't need it, right? It doesn't have to be shame. It could be an independent person, doesn't. But it ties everything together so nicely that it's. That it's quite compelling to think of Malki Tzedek as uh, as shame, um, and uh, uh, you know he he saves him at this fraught uh, this fraught moment. Okay, let me say one more word just about why Malki Tzedek is so important at this uh, at this time, which is just to reflect on the fact that and it's hard to zoom out and and see this in the broader context, but everything that's happened. Just about everything that's happened in uh, in Avram's life so far has forced him into circumstances that call for some kind of compromise. Right? And and again, he could sermonize about this ad uh, ad infinitum. So everyone knows the values and everyone knows the ethics, but when the rubber meets the road, right? So it's not always so obvious, right? What what should be the the ethic that gets priority and what needs to get massaged and how to navigate, right? That's right. That's the that's the challenge of being a human being and being a Jew. So 
nothing has been simple, right? Avraham gets to, to Canaan, and as soon as he does, he has to, to leave. And there's a debate whether he should have left or whether he should have stayed. And then he gets to Egypt, and he has to deceive the Egyptians, and he has to bend the truth. And then he has to get into this uh, decision about what to do with Lot and the shepherds and how to part ways. And now whether or not to enter this unholy alliance with, <laughs> he's going to be on the same team as the king of Sodom to try to say, Everything is morally murky, right? It's a series of unclear, unknowable circumstances that, that call on Abraham to make difficult decisions. And it's exactly in this moment when, right, Abraham might have to make some kind of not great decision about what's going to be his compromise with the king of Sodom, and all of a sudden comes Melchizedek and gives Abraham, right, the moral authority to make, right, this unclouded decision. No, I'm looking up to Hashem, to Kone Shemayim Ba'aretz, as opposed to, uh, you know, what the king of Sodom does, just, you know, how can I, how can I become rich? I want to conclude with an epilogue, and then I'm happy to open it up for some discussion or take uh, or take questions. I want to learn uh, Gemara with you um, as the uh, as the last source on our uh, on our source sheet, and with this I will conclude. The Gemara asks a difficult theological question, okay. um, and it starts with a difficult theological premise. You ready? This is source number eight of Gemara and Adar. Amar Rabbi Abo, Amar Rabbi Elazar, Mene Ma Nenash Avram Avinu, Mene Shtabdu Banav Lumitzrayim, Asayim Be'eser Shani. The question is this. The Gemara sees the Egyptian slavery, the hundreds of years of Egyptian slavery, as a divine punishment. As a divine punishment of Avraham. So, okay, you know, we don't punish children for sins of fathers, but Hashem says, I do, and in the, you know, divine scheme of things, so we're not in a position to question how the world, uh, how the world operates, that may, uh, that may happen from time to time, so the, the Gemara starts with the premise that the hundreds of years that the Jewish people served the slaves in Egypt is punishment for something Abraham, Abraham did wrong, you don't have to see it that way, right, it could be that those years were necessary for the development of uh, people to appreciate uh, Hashem and what it means to be Abdin and what it means to serve a mass, a lot of ways to think about it, but assuming this premise, it's a punishment, okay, so the Gemara says, well, if it's a punishment, so it's a pretty serious deal, what did Abraham do wrong? Three answers. Only one I want to focus on, but in the interest of uh, um, being comprehensive, let's look at all three answers. Mipnei, first answer, One answer, one answer is, um, uh, we would say in Talmudic parlance, Bittel Talmud Torah. Bittel Torah. It says that Hashem, that Avram mobilized his students, right? Uh, the students should have been in base medrash. Don't turn them into soldiers. That was a mistake. He's punished. Okay. Answer number one. Answer number two. Shmuel Amr Bnei Shifri is Almidos of Shal Kodesh Barchu. Shenemar B'Maida Ki Rashenem. Shmuel says, lack of faith. Uh, Hashem said, you're going to be a great nation. You're going to have children and grandchildren. You're going to inherit the land and, uh, and so on. And Abraham says, Bamaida, how will I know? So uh, Shmuel says, as a result of that lack of faith, as a result of that lack of faith, Abraham is punished. Answer number two. Okay, we're not going to focus on those right now. You could have a whole shear on either of those or both. Third answer, Rabbi Yochanan Amar Shifrish Mene Adam Ilikanes Tachas Kanfi Ashkina Shinemar Tainli Anefesh Varachush Kachlach. I talked about this actually in a sermon in Parshas Lachacha, not too long ago. Um, but I'm bringing it up in this context because I think it's so relevant and so powerful. Rabbi Yochanan says, you know what Abraham's mistake was? Abraham's mistake was his answer to the king of stone. The king of stone, stone said, The king of stone said, I want the people. Rabbi Yochanan says, Abraham should have responded and said, I want the people. I want them. I want them because I have the capacity to teach them. 
And Rabbi Yochanan says, Avram made a grave mistake by missing the opportunity to bring those people under the Kante Hashchina. He could have brought them into his tent and been a teacher, the same way that he taught all those people in Haran, right? That's the nefesh, asher asuba Haran. It's the same, same word, the nefesh. It's what Avraham does. He takes people and he helps them see the light of ethical monotheism. And he helps educate them and he helps initiate them into the ways of God. And um, these people were his, literally for the taking. Missed opportunity, Avraham could have taken it. But I, I, what I want to just conclude with is the sense that um, is the sense that for everything that Abraham learned from Malki Tzedek, right? There's also, according to Shmuel, in this formulation, <clears throat> there's also a missed opportunity, right? and there's a there's a balance to be struck. Malki Tzedek reminds Abraham, you want to be in a position to give, and that should be your orientation. Know that everything comes from Hashem. Taking more is not going to really en enrich you. It's not the way the world works. If Hashem has a plan for you, you know, there's going to be a plan for you. So don't worry about it. You're rich enough. You should be giving. And Avram turns around and he starts giving and giving and giving. The, the <clears throat> shadow is that there's also a time to take because there's opportunities in taking to actually give more. And again, there's lots of applications of this. In this case, <clears throat> Abraham's failure to take the people under his wing right, leads them to go back to Sodom. And we know what happens to Sodom. So there's much more to say about that, but I wanna stop here and really just um, not to put too, uh, too fine a point on it, but uh, to just uh, reflect, because I think it's worth reflecting on. Right, the sense that for uh, all the ways in which Abraham is Abraham Avinu and Abraham our teacher and Abraham our patriarch, right? Abraham also has this very deep capacity to be taught and to be a student and to absorb and assimilate the lessons of Malkit Tzedek, of Shem, Melech Shalem, right? Someone who comes along and offers him a new way to think, to think about the world. Okay, and maybe it came from the chesed and the tzedakah that Noah and his kids did on the teva, and maybe that's the basis, wherever it comes from, right? The melech and the yain, it's an orientation of giving and the miser, right? So the, the, the fact that someone could be, right, our model teacher, right, right, that should never be lost on us, that even the model teacher is also, is also a student and also has this profound capacity to, uh, to learn. Okay, I think there's so much there. I think it's so uh, it's so compelling because, um, right, it's, it's a lifetime. It's a lifetime project. And when you think you're finished and you're the team, no, <laughs> you should always, you seek out a Malki Tzedek. Hopefully they come to us in our lives and hopefully we're able to be receptive to them um, and learn and learn, learn their lessons because they will surely be many. I'm going to pause here, but happy to, uh, to stay on and entertain questions or comments.